Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Well, I'm so excited today to be here with Chris Bronner of Dr. Bronner's. Chris, thank you for making time and space to chat with us all today for Next Economy Now. I'd love to ask you um, a question just to start it off. Curious if you might be willing to share maybe a little bit about your role at Dr. Bronner's and some of the things that you're most excited about right now that Dr. Bronner's is up to. Sure. Thank you for having me, Kevin. Well, uh, my role at Dr. Bronner's, I am the strategic advisor and corporate social responsibility manager there. In my CSR role, I oversee some of the environmental efficiency projects, as well as consulting on our regenerative agriculture and other social action projects that we have going on. I interface with our fair trade supply team and kind of looking at um, how our supply chain development, our fair trade and organic supply chain development is going. I'm also involved in various projects around the companies, whatever is needed at the time, basically even involving financial sustainability and strategic planning, etc. So it's a mixed bag and it's a family business. But yeah, I, I do have a strong focus on really streamlining and also institutionalizing our corporate social responsibility efforts. That's a lot to hold. <laughs> and it sounds also like it's a really... It, uh, <laughs> it's a great role, thing too. Is we have a really good team mm-hmm, and... Uh, mm-hmm. It's, it's a really huge team effort, and without their support, you know, of course, this would be not possible. So. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I've met some of the Bronner's team, just really great people. So what are some of the initiatives that you're up to right now in terms of, say, let's focus maybe on environmentally beneficial impact? I know Dr. Bronner's does some extraordinary things. They're exceptional in the world of enterprise, and not everybody knows about them. Maybe if you could highlight one or two that you're, you're personally attached to or excited about. Well, I mean, the biggest concern right now, and it's really our most challenging environmental and threatening environmental problem, which is climate change. We are really gearing kind of all hands on deck, trying to create a plan of how as a business we should be responding and helping to reverse this threat. At many levels, we're trying to do this. The energy level, just our, our basic greenhouse gas emission impact, we are doing a full inventory this year. We've always done our scope one and two emission inventory, but we are adding scope three, which for many businesses is the, you know, the biggest impact, but kind of the hard, most difficult to measure. Yep. So we're taxing that. And also we're investing heavily in renewable energy. We just are completing our solar panel installation as we speak with on-site generation of power. And that will account for more than 50% of our electricity needs. Also in just our our campus, our uh, small headquarters here in Vista, we are implementing permaculture-based landscaping on the strips of land that, that we have. And they're not very big, but we're doing our part to create an example for, you know, there, there are many, many acres of lawns in front of, in front of Southern California business park buildings. And we, we want to create an alternative for people to see that, you know, this is possible, that we can, we can do curb cuts and channel rainwater and harvest them and, and regenerate the little patch of soil that we have control over. So these are these are some of the things, and with with the greenhouse gas emission and climate change activation plan, we are a founding member of the Climate Collaborative, which is an organization that kicked off this in March at the Natural Products Expo of businesses who commit to reduction goals on their greenhouse gas emissions in their business and in their supply chain. So. We are really committed to doing whatever we can as a business first to to look at our direct impact and doing something about it, but then also expanding that impact into what we can do in our supply chain, not to just reduce, but also doing the carbon sequestration work on the ground in our agricultural supply chain. So that's, uh, you know, the, the climate change issue really is kind of a linchpin issue for us to act and to put a lot of resources behind right now. 
I really appreciate all those aspects of the work that Dr. Bronner's and just the, the perspective that you're holding around climate change. What we've seen is there are certain decisions that a business can make that actually have a you know, self-evident return on investment, uh, you know, doing diversified renewable energy will have a, a long-term payoff. And I'm appreciating the effort and the kind of voluntary sacrifice of near-term cash to do to like a photovoltaic installation as an example. But there's other things that uh, Bronner's is doing voluntarily. It's really hard work. And whereas there may be, you know, a clear kind of business ROI in the long run, especially related to resilience in the face of climate change, uh, in the near term, it kind of comes out as a direct cost. You modeling the courage to take those steps, like we encounter very few companies that are looking at scope three in terms of their uh, GHG emissions profile to just footprint with, with where they're at um, and then looking at offsetting or insetting and the different strategies they can take. But uh, I, you know, even calling out the incidental landscaping around the office park, it's a, an exceptional choice for you to model what's possible. It might be a small thing, but it's uh, in, in the long run, if it were to be regionally replicated everywhere, it would have uh, an enormous impact. Not only doing what you can with your own company, but being part of uh, and spearheading and contributing to, as I know you have, the, the larger movement like the, the Climate Collaborative. Bronner is actually voluntarily contributing to those efforts, not just as a member, but as a supporter. Very, very important efforts. Just to dive in a little bit deeper on the scope three, just kind of curious, um, is that something that you're doing in-house? Are you doing it with uh, people outside? Just Because other companies we've met are considering it. There are a few providers out there who help with that. I'm wondering if just, just a couple words, not, not too deep on it, but I'm, I'm curious how you're approaching that. Well, our first approach, I kind of started this last year, is basically by using the GHG protocol tool. It's mm -hmm. a free tool that's provided mm -hmm. by the GHG protocol website, and it was created by Qantas. And basically, it uses your purchasing information using economic data, and they provide factors. I think the factors are maybe, I don't know, five years old, but, but it gives a really nice ballpark starting point for where mm -hmm. your major impact areas are. So we went through that process, and it was very helpful because there's always this trade-off between how much effort you put into measuring and the accuracy of, of um, your measurements versus the resources that you can put into actual mitigation <laughs> projects where even though you don't know exactly what the impact is, you know that there is positive impact. So trying to get a, a balance between that trade-off was important for us. So we put in some efforts into just getting a sense of, okay, where are our areas for potential impact? And the results were very interesting and surprising just based on the factors provided on the GHG protocol tool, agricultural inputs. And for us, since all our feedstock is based in agriculture, mm -hmm. um, that was the biggest area of impact. And then you have packaging, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it was, it was great to be able to rank them in the order of importance and impact so you know what areas you want to tackle first. So for agriculture, however, and this is, you know, going to our supply chain, which is based on certified organic and fair trade supply chain. So the factors are based more on conventional average of what that impact is <laughs> throughout the world. And as you know, industrial agriculture has huge negative impact on greenhouse gas emissions, both because of the production of the synthetic fertilizers and the application of them, as well as the application of herbicides and pesticides provided by the chemical industry and the erosion of our topsoil where, you know, the carbon that's supposed to be in the ground is now released in the air. So conventional agriculture is hugely damaging and really out of balance with our ideal carbon cycle. Whereas in our supply chain, because we utilize organic methods, the comparison, it's, it's not comparable really mm -hmm. to, <laughs> we can't really use yep. the existing factors to really calculate our impact. So, so there you go. We, we, we identified a place where, okay, this is a place where it's really worthwhile to pinpoint you know, how much our positive impact has been really by converting to right. our feedback to organic sources. So the next steps are we are working with the consultant to educate our team on the use of the Cool Farm tool, which I don't know if you've of heard. Of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we're, we're going to do more 
site-specific and project-specific calculations to really gauge, okay, what are our real impact there and where can we improve from there as well? Great. So that's, that's kind of uh, where we're at right now. And then for the remaining part of scope three, I think we are thinking about engaging a consultant just to help us create a system to capture the data on an ongoing basis. Right. And then once it's systematized, then you can have it more frequently updated and see how your kind of decisions are impacting um, and mitigating some of the impact yeah. yep, and more closer to real time and having more updated factors. But that's a great description of the process. I think that'll be very helpful to some of the other organizations and enterprises that uh, we've talked to through Next Economy Now. Appreciate that. I, and also, I think I should highlight just, just how far Dr. Bronner's has thought about already you have a great team, Darcy, Ryan, thinking people thinking about the supply chain and the practices on the ground. You know, and I've seen and heard you share stories about some of the extraordinary investments you've made to support some of the communities, for example, in creating compost operations for having an organic amendment to both not only have the high quality yield and production, but um, it also creates a more resilient farm system in places where there might be climate change induced droughts and, and longer term droughts. So in, in some ways, is, I think Dr. Bronner's, in my experience, is at the leading edge of acknowledging that mitigating through land use in your supply chain, the impacts of, of, of climate change, not only is it increasing the quality of your supply and benefiting the community and mitigating GHG emissions, but it's actually creating more resilience for your supply chain in the long term which is, again, kind of yeah, exceptional. Yeah, for sure. And I want to say that in, in looking at, you mentioned insets before and insets or offsets. So, yes, we've been in the process of implementing these projects that have potential for sequestration. But I want to say that if you're going for the most carbon bang for your buck, agriculture may not be, you know, the, mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. highest um, per car, car, carbon sequester per dollar invested but because agriculture is at the nexus of all these other environmental and social problems, including watershed issues, including food security and climate resilience, as well as multiple other social and environmental problems, that it just it can't be ignored. And some of these other benefits may not be quickly measured, but we just know that this is something that we have to start doing in our supply chain. So yes, while there is that carbon sequestration benefit, the various layers of social benefit is really what drives us and really get us excited. Yeah, it's like you said, that unmeasured stacked function effect of uh, what you're doing that, again, it fits with your values as Dr. Bronner's. And uh, yeah, we see so many other people who look at their emissions footprint and you jump straight to the obvious stuff, which is usually for North American companies uh, is in distribution, shipping, the footprint of transportation in general is a big piece and sometimes manufacturing, depending on what they're doing. But looking at the the primary production, the the agriculture itself, and looking at these huge unmeasured social and uh, long-term beneficial environmental impacts is um, something that we're really excited about seeing Dr. Browners do. Because some of these things might be unmeasured, people listening to this and thinking about their own business might be wondering, and it's a question that comes up a lot, and it's kind of an unfair question because I know there's a gradient of responses to this, but do customers, does the public actually care? So uh, Bronner's has a very strong brand community, and so it might be might be a little bit distinct, but what's your sense for, I mean, maybe it's an impossible question to answer, but do people care? And how does Bronner's think about that question? Well, I I think people do care and increasingly more and more people care. I think the goal is to get enough people caring to create a critical mass so that our economic systems can shift from the current kind of extractive model into a more regenerative model. There's definitely the more early adopters in society where there is increasing awareness about our human impact as part of nature and as we utilize nature for our needs. But what we as business, as a business does, not only to create a product where people who care would value, but also we do our part in educating consumers. So in some ways, our marketing is not just about here, here's a product and why it's great, but it's about telling a story of an alternative way to look at business and looking at 
how we meet our needs and looking at our lifestyles and how that can really transform our environment and our society for the better. So yeah, I do think people care and people in their nature, in our human nature, we we care deeply. It's just a matter of really spreading that education piece and also creating community and, and, and expanding that community of people who care so that they have support and, and resources. I love that. And then for those listeners who I'm sure many of you have uh, know kind of the Dr. Bronner's branding and packaging that that educational ethic and that value has been pretty self-evident in Dr. Bronner's uh, product delivery for a long time. But you do other things too. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share some of the, Dr. Bronner's also is very proactive in doing giving, sponsoring conferences and other educational opportunities to build that brand community of more conscious and aware consumers. Do you want to mention some of the work that Bronner's does that maybe goes unseen that uh, people might not know about? Sure. For an example, this past year, we initiated a campaign called Fair Pay Today to support the ballot initiatives around the country to raise uh, minimum wage for workers. This is one of our kind of social and advocacy initiatives. But what we've done is not only did we support the NGOs that did this work, like the Fairness Project and Business for Fair Minimum Wage, we also coordinated with industry members and other progressive businesses so that we could really strengthen our voice and broaden our message. So part of the initiative involved putting together panels, various trade gatherings, as well as a demo program where we are present in stores to talk to consumers about how a higher minimum wage is better for our business, as well as our workers and society at large. It was a very successful program. I think four states that we were demoing in, they won the ballot measures, and it took many companies together. There are 48 brands who participated in this movement. And I think it was key to have businesses come out and say, we are paying fair wage to our workers and we're succeeding. And there's no excuse for businesses to that you know this would cost too much and to come out against a living wage for workers that's one example in which you know our advocacy leadership can really have the positive social impact that we want and even broader than that when businesses coordinate to advocate for progressive social issues it can really have a great impact great example and i really appreciate that work and yeah i think there's just literally dozens of initiatives that Dr. Bronner's takes on voluntarily through your essentially, you know, corporate philanthropy or giving programs that some of the consumers and uh, some, some of our listeners might not know about. I'm curious um, what, what is kind of on your horizon? What are you looking at for the balance of 2017 or even further into the future that you're excited about with regards to Bronner's and, and or things that you're watching in the, in the whole space that, that are inspiring to you? Obviously, the Climate Collaborative and, and other groups that you're participating in are, are pretty exciting. But I'm curious if there's things that are on your radar that uh, you would want the listeners to know about that are exciting to you or inspiring to you. Well, yes, the, the Climate Collaborative and um, the work on balancing our carbon cycle is, is really going to take a lot of effort. And for the many coming years, that'll be a huge focus for us. One of the things that is very exciting for us and we've been supporting is Project Drawdown by Paul Hawkins, his new book that came out, which he says is the most comprehensive uh, plan ever to draw down carbon and reverse climate change. And we're super excited by something like this that really turns the conversation from weak and hopeless one into a very hopeful and potentially activating one. So we're going to look at that very closely and, and look at the strategies that are outlined there to see like what within our scope of influence we can implement. One of the areas that would be very close to my heart would be to, through our fair trade supply chain, to see where we can fit in initiatives that would empower women and girls, which was one of the, <laughs> the, the strategies that is one of the most surprising successful strategies modeled in the Drawdown book. That would be really exciting for me. Um, and in addition to the climate change actions, well, this is also related to climate change, but we are uh, looking a lot into ways that we can 
promote regenerative agriculture in the U.S., not just in our supply chain. Most of our supply chain is based in, in tropical countries, but just because we're based in the U.S., American agriculture system has such an impact in the world. We want to really do something to see if we can tip the balance and really make regenerative agriculture economically viable alternative to industrial agriculture. So we're looking into putting together a new regenerative agriculture standard that would be kind of the gold standard in sustainable agriculture. We're collaborating with, you know, other exemplar businesses and, and ranches who are already demonstrating how it can be both economically and environmentally positive. So that's very exciting. We hope that it could create an example, but also a pathway for, you know, other businesses and other farmers, ranchers who are tired of the industrial model and the damages that it has done to switch over in a step-by-step way. So those, uh, those are a couple of things that are definitely on the immediate horizon. And we're still working on income inequality as a major issue for us. And so there will be more effort raising the minimum wage across the country and other states that might have ballot measure initiatives or ballot measure process, or to see if we can get some movement in the federal legislation. And probably we're looking at supporting an initiative in Hawaii where the minimum wage is right now the lowest in the country when you adjust for cost of living. Hmm. So yeah, we're, we're also continuing to fight on that front and uh, a few others, but these are the ones that are really, I think, the most crucial ones. No small problems <laughs> to tackle. <laughs> no, just just, no. just income and equity and uh, climate change, you know, small stuff like that. That's, uh, <laughs> I see it as kind of a follow through on the Bronner's values. And, you know, even in this kind of discussion, I'm kind of seeing this value of education and taking a stand and how that spills over not only into direct action, but also into advocacy or activism, which is a potent question right now in this country in particular with companies in terms of what they can do in the spirit of building this next economy and while advocating for those policies that are kind of actively resisting some other policies that could lead to you know increased inequities and socially detrimental action. You, you might not know this, but I worked on the, the Project Drawdown for the last three years as, as one of the senior researchers, and I'm really excited to hear that at some that uh, companies like Dr. Bronner's are kind of grabbing onto and using in that way to kind of look at the practices and see within your supply chain and what you do on the ground, where you might be able to, with your level of agency, um, directly influence or implement some of those practices on the ground. I'm super gratified to hear that. This has been really wonderful, and I'm noticing the time and appreciating your time. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything that you could think of that you might want to share with the Next Economy Now listeners about Dr. Bronner's culture. You, you have an incredible team. I've had the pleasure of meeting a number of uh, your folks. You attract incredible talent and I'm wondering if there's things that you do internally that also speak to social impact that are beneficial. You're, you're a B Corp. You score in that highest percentile of B Corps to be acknowledged as one of the top B Corps of the 2200 and growing number of B Corps in the world, which I'm, again, we're grateful that you, you've taken that step to join that community as well. But I'm wondering if there's anything you could say about this amazing team that you're, you've built and, and continue to build. Well, I can't say enough about our team. <laughs> it's really a, every day I'm just so amazed at the dedication and the passion that they bring to their work and our, our work together. And I think the major thing that we're working towards, what, what gives us this drive is that we really believe that we're utilizing our you know, position as uh, being part of this company for something greater than just ourselves. And I think that that sense of this expanded identity of what means to be a human being, a citizen, is kind of what is needed in the world. And I think that really attracts people. It attracts people who are seeing, okay, what we've done in the last 100 years, focusing our uh, material survival and, you know, insatiable profit, it just is not working. And yeah, I think we're we're attracting people to not just our work, but a general philosophy about what it means to be, you know, a human, how we should live and, and how we should apply our energy. And it's, you know, really 
not basically we're, we're continuing Dr. Bronner's original vision and our founder, Dr. Bronner, he started this company not with the intention of just selling soap and making money. It was about spreading a message of peace and connectedness. And that's really the foundation, the sense of connectedness, of being in touch with our humanity that, that can transform people's lives and, and uh, create a regenerative economy. So yeah, I think as far as culture, <laughs> I think we were just very, uh, how should I say, um, we really believe in the connectedness that Dr. Bronner talked about. And even though his ranting on, on his labels can be um, esoteric at times, <laughs> um, I think at heart, it's something that is the foundation of our culture. And that really drives the work that we do on a daily basis. And you do it so well. I'm, I'm really grateful for all the work that you and the Dr. Bronner's team are doing we recognize Dr. Bronner's as one of those iconic standout family-owned businesses in North America right now that are courageously looking at the big problems of our time and taking action on in many, many levels. So in, in terms of next economy now, Dr. Bronner's is, is one of the leaders leading us into that possibility. Chris, I'm so, so grateful for your time and for, for sharing. Um, any last words? Well, I want to thank you for giving me an opportunity for listening. And yeah, it's been a great conversation. And also, thank you for your work on Project Drawdown. It's really, um, it's really crucial work that you've done to kind of liberate us <laughs> into a realm of hope and, and action to tackle this pressing problem in our time. Thank you so much. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.